So I got to thinking about uh, Trinity Sunday. I love Trinity Sunday. I especially enjoy the fact that Trinity Sunday is one of those Sundays that most clergy pastor types struggle with. Sometimes people just don't even talk about Trinity Sunday because the mystery is so huge uh, and so difficult for us to comprehend. It's hard to break it down. As a matter of fact, before I even left today, I, I do this thing with my covenant brothers. I've shared this with you several times, but every morning when we get up, uh, when we go to, we're getting ready to go to church. All of them are clergy in the United Methodist Church in Florida. And we text each other and we just say, hey, I'm praying for you. And, and then usually we, we add some really flowery theological statement. Blessings, peace, and honor be to you, O oh brothers. May the fire of heaven fall down upon your congregation and consume them in your immense love. Blah, 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 you know, none of us are like that. But we text that way every week. And so today I got up and nobody bleeped on my phone yet. It was about 6.15. I said, I'm going to be the first today. So I texted them, praying for you, brothers. Preach Holy Trinity. And then I put a little sat, you know, dash and I said... Do not be afraid to commit any heresies because it's a mystery anyways. Because you always run the risk of committing a great heresy when you preach on Trinity Sunday by trying to explain or simplify something that cannot be simplified. So we have been given permission by the Holy Spirit to do our best and to be aware that there might be a few heresies that occur. Because in trying to understand and explain God, well, it's almost humorous. So I got to thinking about what, in what ways we might connect, and I got to thinking about how each and every one of us have our own subjective feelings, our own personal beliefs, our own ideas, the things that, that we've been formed by that lead us to uh, our own thoughts on issues, or let our minds kind of roam and wander. And, and so then I got to thinking, you know, how do we all respond to pictures we see and, and became very aware that there's a great statement that's made that a picture's worth a thousand words. <laughs> that is an extremely cute kid. That's a picture only a mother can love. I think I was in, what, second grade? Third grade. But when you see that picture, you have all kinds of thoughts that come into your mind, don't you? What a goofy looking kid. Uh, how old is that kid? Could that possibly be Pastor Terry? That kid has hair. I mean, you can go on and on and on. And, and I got to think, of, you know, what is that kid thinking? Could be. Maybe cute girls? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's not really what the kid's thinking. Maybe the kid's thinking... That might actually be what the kid is thinking. Smile, really? I kind of vaguely remember that day. You know, picture day at school. And there's this really weird, kind of quirky photographer who wants all the kids to smile. And so you have to coax a smile out of the kids. Those of you who teachers know this day. Um, you send the kids down to the camera place and you get a break. Um, and I remember sitting there and I, the guy was like in plaid or something and he had a squeaky toy, which I thought was unusual for elementary age kids. You don't use a squeaky toy for kids in third grade. But he'd like, look at the camera. And I think that this is the moment. I'm trying to smile. I'm trying to smile. But maybe actually this is what the kids think. Squirrel. <laughs> that might be the truth. I got to think of the images and, and when we see something in front of us, especially a picture, how we immediately begin to form stories. We draw upon our own subjective thoughts, personal thoughts, belief systems, how we were formed, where we grew up, who were the influences in our lives. Within the biblical and theological world, we call it using the lens that we've been given. In other words, each and every one of us read the story through the lens that we have. We even read scripture that way, don't we? Um, and all of us have lenses. We have our own personal lenses. But sometimes those limits, lenses are very limited. 
So I thought to play around with a few more pictures just to see what you thought. You know, participatory sermon. I, I want you to share with what you see in these pictures. So this next picture, what do you see? Friends, mission trip, family, fun. Tell me the story. What's going on in this picture? What's construction? When I first saw this picture, I can't believe it. It, it. it failed miserably in the first service too. But my first thought was fraternity party. <laughs> Beth, thank you. It just says something about who you are. You know, I look at that picture and I think, that's a fraternity party. But each and every one of us have an idea of what that picture represents because of our own thoughts and the way our brains start to spin. That is actually a picture of a college group doing work on a Habitat for Humanity house. That's the truth. That's the true story. That's the true story. How about this next picture? Tearing down the wall. Freedom. Desegregation, fall of communism, anger. Anybody get a, a violent tone from that picture? Say it. Say it loud. This boy wants to stand up and say something. Yeah, what do you see? A group of people tearing down a wall. A group of people tearing down a wall. That is exactly what's happening. Uh, when I showed my daughter Emily that picture, she said, it's a riot. But for those of us who grew up during that day and age, we know that this is a picture of tearing down of the Berlin Wall that separated East and West Germany. How about this picture? So what do you think when you see this picture? Dangerous. <laughs> the next generation of bikers. Anybody else? What story is forming in your head as you see this picture? Yeah. Love. Love? Yeah, I can see some love in there. What else? How soft-hearted bikers really are. How soft-hearted bikers really are. I'd be honest, when I first saw this picture, I immediately thought, how dare this guy put a baby on a motorcycle? <laughs> My second thought is, where did this biker pick up a baby? <laughs> He must have found this baby wandering around the street somewhere and picked it up. He needs a helmet, that baby, right? That would make it a whole lot safer if the baby had a helmet, right? That is actually a picture from an ad campaign for Bikers for Babes. I love the play on words uh, because, you know, you always hear about biker babes. But these are real babies, and uh, what they were doing was supporting mother, unwed mothers who had children. And so this was their, their ad campaign. Pictures are worth a thousand words, and when we all see a picture, immediately our minds begin to click into gear, and we start drawing on our resources, and we, 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 we desire to put the story together. We? We, want to, we want to arrive at a conclusion, find some facts about it, know the truth about it, behind it. How many of you watch CSI? Yeah, you can confess. Come on. Why do you like those crime scene investigation shows? It's the mystery, right? You get a bunch of little pieces, and then you try to put it all together, and it's amazing how they use all this technology. They figure out the crime. I mean, we like trying to figure it all out, come to some conclusion. That's the way our brains work. It's the way we exist within our humanity. Um, and so pictures and images, uh, well, a lot of times the stories are formed from within. Who we are, our thoughts, our beliefs. What about this picture? Ancient. Ancient. Yeah. The Last Supper. The Last Supper. Fellowship, Trinity, mm -hmm. 
sadness, grief. What's happening at this table? What's the story that's playing in your mind? Look at the picture. The one on the left is not happy with the two on the right. One on the left is telling a story to the other two and they're listening. A trip to Emmaus. Something's in that hole. Something's in that hole. Well, let me just mention that about the bowl. Because this company only brings the best wine. This is the icon, uh, ancient icon of the Holy Trinity. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, three in one. The Greek word for how we understand God's relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is homoousia, which means of the same substance. And yet, they are three persons, yet one identical God. Inseparable from the beginning of creation. Now this is the part that will just blow your mind if you keep thinking about it. Because it is known as a divine and holy mystery. There's no way we can possibly fully comprehend how big our God is. Amen. The creator of the universe. Amen. But what I see in this picture is relationship. The three are gathered around the table. They are feasting together. They are in a relationship with each other. And what I love about this icon of the Holy Trinity is that they are inviting us to join them. If you look hard enough at this icon, you will notice that the two on each side form a chalice in the middle. Look at their bodies, the negative space. And if you notice, we, there's a space there for us to come and join them. You see, the beauty of this icon and the testimony that we find throughout Scripture is that our God is a God of relationship. We worship in and of itself relational God. God invites us to participate with God's mighty acts of salvation. God invites us to participate in the work of the new creation. God invites us to participate and to even wallow through the mysteries that are God. And so you and I are invited to the table. We've been invited to participate in this relationship that God has, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't have to completely figure it out or understand it. We want to do that, don't we? I mean, that's what we immediately try to do when we see a picture. Uh, I do it all the time. We'll see a picture. Uh, Leslie and I will play the game of what's going on in the picture. Have you ever been at a really crowded event? Anybody a people watcher out there? It's one of my favorite things to do now that I'm getting older. You know, when I was younger, people watched me. Now I like watching people. And uh, I can remember we were in Key West. Yeah, I know you. Oh, yeah. There's some people to watch in Key West, let me tell you. And we were sitting there at the table. Leslie and I were reading. We were watching the street, and there were lots of people. And we play that game where we try to figure out what they're saying to each other, what's going on. You ever do that? I mean, you got to be really bored to do that. <laughs> it keeps your marriage strong, just so I can let you know. If you run out of things to talk about, talk about other people. <laughs> well, we got to figure out, we want to know the answer and the truth that the Spirit offers us, that we hear in the text today. When Jesus is sharing with the disciples, he says, you know, I'm about to leave you. And I can't possibly reveal you everything there is to know about God. Because it'll blow your little heads off their shoulders. Off your shoulders. But the Holy Spirit is coming. And the Holy Spirit is truth. And the Holy Spirit will reveal all truth to you. And there's a whole lot more to come. There's a whole lot more to come. So open your lives to the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Because it's through the work of the Holy Spirit that you will become more and more aware of how God acts and who God is. Not only in the midst of your life, but in the world all around us. If we can get one thing right, it's that we understand that our God is all about relationships. And that God takes those relationships very, very seriously. Invites us to dine at the table of forgiveness and redemption and healing and restoration and peace and joy and life. And God offers all of that. And the good news for me and for you today is that we don't have to try to figure it all out. But rather we can enjoy it as we exist within God's presence. That we can experience it each and every day. And each and every day we find something new and something glorious around us. Even in the darkest of times. Even in the desert places. Even when you feel like God is far, far away. God is not far away. God is present with you. And it's even in those moments when we finally arrive at the end where we see a little light or we walk out of the desert and we find the oasis and we take a drink of water that we look back and we say, my God, you were with me the whole time. Amen. See, the beauty of Holy Trinity Sunday <laughs> is that we get a little too Jesus-centric. Jesus In other words, we focus a lot on Jesus, and we should. God in flesh, God with us, God for us. But our God is three in one. Our God is the creator of the universe. Our God has come to us in flesh and is the redeemer and lover of our souls. Our God is spirit, and the very spirit of God, the very breath of God, resides within us in our lives here and now, today. And pushes us forward to move in the midst of creation to celebrate the things that God is. And what can we know about God? Well, we see it in Jesus Christ. He reveals the fullness of God. And what does God look like? God is love, amen? amen? God does not manipulate or coerce, amen? amen? Oh, you need to hear that one, don't you? There's a lot of people out there preaching a gospel of manipulation and coercion, and I got to tell you, that's not of God. God does not manipulate or coerce. God does not objectify others. As a matter of fact, the testimony of that we find in Scripture is that God does not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped, but humbles God's self, taking the form of a servant. Amen. God enters into our existence in an equal relationship with God's creation. God becomes human. Wow! Our God is a God of peace. God does not exist in the midst of violence. God does not take life. God gives life. Our God heals and restores and makes new. And our God is always in the business of creating. It didn't just stop. As a matter of fact, that great, here it goes. Ready, Curtis? My resident scientist over here. Um, but the great uh, physicist Dawkins made the proclamation years ago that he believes that the universe is actually expanding. Expanding. You get that right? Yeah, pretty good? That was not too tough, was it? Expanding. And what's really cool is that with all the discoveries we find in the world today, all the things that science is, un is kind of revealing to us, we're actually experiencing and seeing the very fingerprint of God on the pattern of the universe. This is how relational our God is. Every fiber of our being, every fiber of the known world, the known universe, bears the mark of God, the image of God. 
Now, when we go back to Genesis, we hear the, the statement that, you know, in the beginning God created all these things, and it ends up with hum, humanity, and in God's image, God created them, male and female, God created them. And we always say, you know, we're created in the image of God. Well, i got news for you. The whole creation is created in the image of God. It bears the image of God, the fingerprint of God upon it. And we find that because as they're discovering more and more things within the scientific world, uh, for a while, you know, they thought the atom was the smallest thing that ever existed, right? Well, now they're realizing there are other particles that exist that are smaller than that. And they're all related in some way to each other. And even in the known universe, we find this idea of recreation. Because there's this, uh, there's this great theory called chaos theory, in which it says everything seems to be normal and stable. And then all of a sudden it becomes destabilized. And it crashes in on itself. And there's chaos. But out of the chaos comes new birth. Where else does that happen? In my life, how about yours? That our God is always about bringing something new out of the chaos. Amen? I mean, the atom itself really has three principal parts. <laughs> I have two science classes. <laughs> My wife's a scientist, but I'll go with the curse. A proton, an electron, and a neutron. Woohoo! I'm getting an A. <laughs> Three. Principal parts. Now an atom can take on other electrons and representing different chemicals and those types of things. But what's the mystery of that is the relationship between the proton, the electron, and the neutron. How they exist with each other. It's within those subatomic particles, within the creation itself, that we can find the very fingerprint of God. And it's all about So the invitation for you today on this Trinity Sunday is to stop trying to figure it out <laughs> and open your hearts and your lives and your eyes and your ears to experience the wonder and the awe of God breaking through all realms. That's what Jesus means when he uses the word kingdom. He's not talking about setting up a little fortress and ruling on a throne. He's talking about God's action, God's work, God's new creation unfolding before us each and every day. And we've been invited to participate in that. So no matter where you are, no matter what corner of the world you find yourself, or whatever room you might find yourself in, when you see love, when you see peace, when you see moments of joy and celebration, when you see healing and experience it, when you see the beauty and the glory of God's created order, even in the midst of its chaos sometimes, you actually see the very fingerprint of God. And you can step back and say, wow.